Thank you very much. I am uh, honored to, uh, to be here. I, uh, I turned down about nine out of ten speaking engagements these days, but uh, persistence paid off, and uh, I'm here, and I love Alabama, and I've, uh, I've never had a, a bad visit to Alabama. So uh, I, was, uh, I was very glad it worked into the schedule, and also to be included in, uh, among all the other great authors you've had here in the Southern Voices. I was born in Fort Lauderdale, which I guess I guess is southern. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you drove around Fort Lauderdale for a while, you would think it was southern. But uh, when I was born there, it certainly was a southern town. And my father was an attorney, and my grandfather was an attorney there. And I wisely stayed out of the law. I think they were thrilled about that, too. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about trying to, to explain and defend some of the novels I've written, because uh, <laughs> they, it, it's it's very it's some of them I look back on them myself and I and I really wonder what was going on in my head at the time, um, and I and I blame it mainly on uh, the location the the place that I grew up and the place I still live in South Florida. Um, I've spent my whole life uh, trying to scare people away from South Florida, as particularly tourists, and and I've done everything I c I can. I've written everything I could possibly write, and still they come. No, nothing <laughs> nothing seems to daunt them. Um, and uh, the, the stories, the true life stories that come out of South Florida and Florida in general now are so, uh, to stay ahead of the curve of weirdness is very challenging. <laughs> uh, uh, when, you, when you write satire, which is what I write, the object is to be just a, a bit ahead of it, to just cr take the real, real life and crank it up a couple of notches. It's impossible. I've, I've, written, I've written some of the sickest uh, prose in the, in the history of the English language. And, and some of the scenarios that are truly, I'm afraid to even show my mother the manuscripts of the books, yet they're eclipsed by the next day's headlines. It's a constant, it's constantly discouraging. So I want to share with you, I, I bring, the reason this file is so thick is I bring the real news clippings, because in case I, I have to produce evidence uh, that, that I'm not making this stuff up. And I'll just, this is, the, this is sort of the, the flow the, the flood of information that comes in every day when, you, when you're a novelist and a journalist working in Florida that you have to deal with emotionally and, and, and try to figure out what it all means and, and what you do with it. And this, these are all true stories. I'll just start with, with a few of these. This is in Weewahitchka, Florida, last year. I'll just give you the first paragraph of the story. A woman who had just purchased an 1,800-pound camel for her exotic wildlife farm was killed during a TV taping when the animal sat down on her. <laughs> the, the victim's husband said that the camel was in a state of high agitation because of mating season. Th that's, a, that's a video clip that I don't want to see when I'm on the cable, you know, the, um, this is classic. This happens almost every other day, but I include it because it probably doesn't happen. This was just a couple months ago. An 80-year-old woman who went to get a driver's license plowed her car into the office of the Department of Motor Vehicles, injuring 11 people. Uh, the good news is she did not get her license that day. Um, this is, and this happens all the time. And Key West, I, I lived for many years in the Florida Keys, so these stories are... Uh, you know, to me, just routine, but this was a couple years ago in Key West. This was the first two paragraphs. A disoriented man with slurred speech called police at, at, to his seaside hotel to report that his high-quality Bahamian marijuana had been stolen. <laughs> you, know, you almost have to give him credit, though, don't you, just for making that phone call. Um, this is in a place called Yuli, Florida. Yuli, Florida, 2003. A 44-year-old man was badly burned when he attempted to drain the gas tank of his Chevrolet van by shooting it with a pistol. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's just some people that are sort of born with that little dark cloud over their head. Uh, I talk, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about why certain people come to Florida because Florida is the victim of its own allure, of its own beauty in all manner of, of good people come there and then you have a large percentage of derelicts and psychopaths who come there on a regular basis. Some of them run for public office. Uh, 
and others don't. Um, this, is, this is a classic example. This is in 2004 in a town called Palm Coast, Florida. A woman drove all the way from Oklahoma to Palm Coast, Florida with the body of her dead mother in the passenger seat so that she could go shopping at a Walmart store that she liked in that town. And she just parked her mom, this has been a long drive, by the way, in the, in the wall, and I, they just arrest her, and she said, well, so what? I wasn't doing anything. It's my mom. I can carry her around as long as I want with it. <laughs> now, this is not 1997 in Miami. The Dade County Better Business Bureau declares bankruptcy. <laughs> there you go. Um, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, my hometown. A Broward Sheriff's deputy was fired after she pawned her service revolver to pay off a gambling debt. <laughs> this, is, this is all by way of introducing the topic of my talk, which is uh, the, the case against intelligent design. Um, <laughs> If, if you're from Florida, and if you've spent any time there, if you spent your whole life there, as I have, there, there's not even a debate uh, about uh, which direction evolution is going on this planet. <laughs> it's going backwards for at least one species, and, 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 I, and I, there's no end to the evidence of that. Um, th this, was, this has just happened at the holiday. This, we're just out of the holiday season, so I thought I'd share a little something, a little heart-touching story that happened uh, right before Christmas. Uh, in, um, in Bell Harbor, Florida, which is a, it's kind of an affluent area near Miami Beach. Um, well, for some, I, don't, I doubt seriously if you have this problem here in Birmingham, but in South Florida, we have a tremendous problem with uh, people stealing figures out of nativity scenes. Don't ask me why, but apparently nativity scenes are a hot, a hot item among thieves. So in Bell Harbor, uh, a baby Jesus statue was stolen from a nativity scene, and it made the news. And a, uh, a, a resident of Bell Harbor, who happened to be Jewish, um, came forward and said, this is a disgrace. I'm going to buy a new baby Jesus, and I'm going to put him in the nativity scene, but I'm going to, I'm going to put a GPS locator <laughs> just in the baby Jesus so that if he gets stolen again, we'll know. This is on December 22nd. Let me read you a headline from December 28th. Woman charged in theft of GPS-equipped Jesus. <laughs> now, Imagine you're a law enforcement officer and your agent, and the call goes out, and you've got your tracker, and you're tracking little Jesus all over the place, and you've got to go in and... Anyway, that's, my, that's the beginning of my case against intelligent design. Those of us who live in South Florida, we have a saying, and of course, um, uh, we, uh, we explain to relatives and visitors and, and people who come to see us that we care about when they all ask the same question that every sane person asks, like, what is going on here? Why is this happening? We always, we call it the sludge factor, and that is, if you tilted the continental United States up a little bit, all the sludge would ooze down to the tip of the Florida Peninsula. It would be gravity. And that's what we've always, we've always uh, sort of assumed this was true. I think the whole nation got a pretty good look at that in the year 2000 in the presidential election. I, <laughs> None, none of that was any, was any surprise to those of us who lived there. I'll tell you why. I woke up that, that morning after, uh, after the, uh, the rest of the nation voted, and, and uh, go, I went to bed thinking that, uh, that George Bush had beaten Al Gore. And, uh, and I wake up, and I turn on the television, and there's Brokaw on one station, and there's Peter Jennings on another, and, and there's Dan Rather. And I, I know these guys aren't up at eight, normally at 7 in the morning after they've been up all night on an election that was supposedly over, and I, I know something's not right. And as I'm sort of trying to wake up, and I see all of them have the exact same graphic behind them, like this. And that is a graphic with the state of Florida on it. <laughs> and then on that graphic is highlighted in color Palm Beach County. 
And I, without even hearing what was coming out of the TV at this point, I just said, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, boy. This is, this is not a good day for the Republic. And sure enough, it, it disintegrated from there. Um, they, everybody, they, every, almost every national news story that has even a, a touch of slime to it uh, winds its way, and there's a connection in South Florida. It never fails. Um, in some of the most horrific stories as well. Uh, the day after, uh, on September 12th, uh, 2001, when all of us were glued to our sets trying to figure out what in the name of God was going on with the, the who were the hijackers, who were these monsters that had committed this horrible thing, the FBI started releasing the names and photographs of the hijackers of the aircraft. And I'm sitting there on the couch with my wife, and I'm seeing the pictures, Muhammad Ad, all these guys. And I said to her, I said, I swear to God, those are Florida driver's licenses. She goes, no. I said, I'm telling you, those are Florida driver's licenses. Guess what? This was not an accident, by the way, that nine of these characters, uh, up to 11, they know nine for sure, possibly 11, had lived and trained in the great state of Florida. This was not an accident. I'm, I want you to put yourself, if you can, in the, you're, imagine bin Laden, and he's sitting in this cave, and he's scraping the bat guano out of his beard, and he's got this map of the United States and where he's going to plant these guys, Okay. And they've got to live here for a while. They've got to train on these 757 simulators. They gotta, they've got to live and sort of blend in. And he's looking all over the country. And he's thinking to himself, where is the, bad, the bar of bad behavior so high that these knuckleheads will not be noticed no matter what they do? Florida. <laughs> Send them to Florida. And sure enough, they... They had a great time in Florida, by the way, for being as devout as they were. They hung out at strip joints. Uh, they were putting $20 bills in the G-strings of the dancers, who I, I'm sure they thought were some of the virgins they were going to meet later <laughs> after they crashed the freaking airplanes. These were the girls they were going to meet. They passed themselves off as Egyptian airline pilots, trying to pick up the same virgin strippers. Um, and the other thing they did was they went into these flight schools. They went into these flight schools, and they, um, and where, you know, you or I might have to pay with a credit card or maybe a check, they handed, in one case, eight grand in cash to a guy and said, can we train on this jet simulator? And by the way, we don't need to do the part where you land the plane. We just like to know. <laughs> and he said, sure, Muhammad, go nuts. And he takes the cash. Now, the one, the one schmuck who goes to Minneapolis, the one guy goes up there, and he's going to pull the same. He's in jail in about 30 seconds. After he, his head is spinning. He's in jail so fast. They right away figure out what's going on. Not in Florida. Oh, come on in. As long as you want, go have a great time. Train on the simulators. One point, a couple months before uh, September 11th, a plane, a, Cess, uh, a Cessna or Piper, lands on the busiest commercial runway at Miami International Airport, one of the busiest airports in the world. And it, it came from a flight school over in Bradenton, Florida. Two gentlemen are aboard. One of them is Muhammad Atta. Another is one of the other hijackers. The pl they land this plane. They weren't supposed to take it out of their little area of training over there. They decided just for the hell of it, let's go to Miami. And they land on the commercial runway, and they stall it out. They stall the plane out after they land it. And they're in the middle of the runway, far from the terminal. And here's what they do. They say, oh, crap. And they climb out of this plane. You know, there's 747s lined up waiting to take off behind them. If, I guess they don't have horns on those things, but everybody's saying, what the hell is this? These guys, these guys, who, by the way, use their own names. Their own names were on the, on, on the flight registry and the flight, everything. They had plenty of documentation who they were. They jump out of the plane. They leave it there. They run across about two miles of open runway, hop a fence, hail a cab, and go back to Bradenton. The FAA has this information for all this. Not one follow-up follow phone call is made. Nobody at the flight school is contacted. Nothing happens. And September 11th, they're on the jets. These guys, where else are they going to get away with this nonsense? But Florida. They all come to Florida. They, they all come to Florida. Um, after the second O.J. Simpson trial, the, the one with the, the non-lobotomized jury, um, <laughs> 
that sort of put together the fact that he might have been involved in that um, terrible double homicide. And they, and they found a civil judgment, and it's substantial, I think over $30 million against O.J. Simpson for his part in that. And on, on the steps of the courthouse after the verdict is read, there's his attorney saying, you know, this is outrageous. Uh, Mr. Simpson can't afford to pay this money. Um, uh, he, he doesn't have the money. Uh, he, he may have to leave the state of California. And I turned to my wife <laughs> and I said, that son of a bitch is coming to Florida. <laughs> there he was. My buddy Rush Limbaugh. Now, he comes, to, he, I guess he hears that we have the friendliest pharmacists in the country. Because he comes to Florida and proceeds to hook up with enough pharmacies to buy enough Vicodin to eat in a day that you would kill a normal elephant, to be honest with you. And, and you know, I, I, and I enjoy listening. I mean, he's funny. He's, I would be funny, too, if I were ripped to the gills on that much <laughs> oxycodone. But there was no problem. And, yes, Mr. Limbaugh, this is your 17th. Here you go, prescription. Sure, I'm sure you lost the last pills. He came here. They're all here. Everybody's here. You know, a few months ago, uh, we had a, a, a lovely story out of the, uh, the, the uh, legislature, the U.S. Uh, the House of Representatives, by Representative Mark Foley from Florida, Republican <laughs> from Florida. You know, I don't care what these guys really do in their own private time. I couldn't care less. If they're, if they're good at what they do, if they vote the way they believe, if they represent their constituency, that's fine. But when you're sitting on the floor of the House of Representatives with your laptop on your lap, and I really mean on his lap, um, and they're voting on an Iraq funding bill, and you're having internet sex with one of your young friends, and you have to interrupt this little, this little exchange, excuse me while I vote on the war, and then go back to what you're doing, then I think you've crossed the line. I think, Mark, at that point, I, I really think the Founding Fathers did not have um, that in mind in the deliberative process of, of, the, of the Congress. Um, we are very proud to have Mark, as, you know, the, that's, what, that's why I was surprised when the Larry Craig thing happened. I mean, he's not from Florida. I thought, this is what, <laughs> dude, what the hell? What is, like what, two months he'll move there? He'll be there, he'll, he's coming down. Um, you know, I don't mean to be cruel about this next case, but it's classic. Uh, you know, of all the places, of all the places in the world, she could have died. She could have gone to overdose herself. <laughs> Anna Nicole Smith, no. She has to come to the Seminole Hard Rock, because we haven't done enough to the Indians, have we? We haven't really abused them enough. Let's have this starlet come and overdose in their hotel and casino, and which gives them more fame and more notoriety than anything they've ever done. The poor, you know, Anna Nicole Smith has to come to Florida to die. And this, of course, is a major news story because there's nothing else going on important in the world in Darfur or Iraq or Afghanistan that this is the lead story for about six weeks since uh, Anna Nicole Smith. Everybody, I, I don't know what it is, some sort of perverse magnet of weirdness. And I'll give you an example. Let's say, uh, let's say uh, you're, you're, you and your boyfriend are having troubles. Your boyfriend's married, and you don't want him to be married anymore. And... Um, and you find out that the woman he's married to is going to be getting on a plane in Orlando, Florida, and you want to confront her. And le let's say you're an astronaut, okay? <laughs> you, you get in your car, you put on your astronaut diaper, you get your can of mace, get you some rope, and you drive to the Orlando airport and you mace this woman. Why not? The space, the space program's in good hands. And, you know, uh, she couldn't have, she didn't, she didn't come to Birmingham to do it, did she? No. The floor, I guess maybe after she did this, she was going to go to Disney World. Why not? <clears throat> Speaking of Disney World, I wrote a book. I, I wrote a little nonfiction screed a few, uh, a few years ago called um, Team Rodent about the, the Disney empire. They, they weren't real happy with the, the book. It was just my own personal take on Disney, but there's some great things that have been happening. 
Tigger's been in some trouble lately. I know if you've got kids and, or grandkids, you know Tigger and Winnie the Pooh, and I've always been a, kind of a Tigger fan. This is a true story. This happened in Disney World. A couple years ago, Tigger, Tigger was accused of, of groping a tourist. I know, during a photo. So you know how you let your kids run up to the, you know. I've written a lot about it. I did a whole big thing for the Herald on I, I, lawsuits about, uh, that occur at Disney World. And a lot of them involve employees. And these employees work very hard. They're not paid very much money. They're cast members, not employees, by the way. And, they, and these uniforms are hot. It's summertime. And, and sometimes parents just let their kids get nuts. So I've always had a lot of sympathy for these characters. Well, Tigger was supposedly, she, he's got mom and he's got the, the little girl in the picture, and they takes a picture, and everything's fine. Well, the next day, she goes to the police and says, Tigger groped me. They go to this guy, this poor guy, not making much money. They throw the cuffs on him, and they say, Tigger, you're going to the slammer. He goes, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. So his defense, which was brilliant, and it worked, and it was true, by the way, is that he, he, they bring the Tigger costume into court, the Tigger costume in front of the jury. Um, Disney, Disney, first of all, this is the great thing about Disney. They said, can we, can we do a simulated Tigger costume? Because we don't want our, the real Tigger to be slurred by this. Can we do it, make it leopard or cheetah or something? And they said, no. Use it. But we, you know, they wanted like a, a pseudo Tigger. To, and they said, no, we're bringing the exact costume that Tigger had on. So the Tigger guy's there. And his defense all along was, I don't have any fingers. I, I didn't grope nobody because I got no fingers. And I mean, you feel you saw the guy interviewed on TV, and he was very insistent. He was going to fight for his reputation. So here's what this is how it unfolds always in Florida. He, Tigger's completely innocent, of course. He doesn't. He, he was. He was innocent. One of the one of the victims' friends comes forward and says, "You know what? I can't watch this anymore." I can't sit by, we'll let this happen anymore. She came back to the room. This was, we just came down here for one reason. That was to file a lawsuit against Disney World. That was the whole reason we came down here. We went, she went in with the idea of looking for, it could have been, it could have been Mickey Mouse. It could have been one of the little trolls, the little <laughs> grumpy or sneezy or snotty or whatever the hell their names are. And it didn't matter. They were just looking for a scam. And so she's going to, case dropped, Tigger's gone. And now they were going to go after the, the woman for false prosecution and all kinds of other things. But only in Florida would someone, let's go to not just a Disney World vacation, but a bonanza. We'll go to Disney World. We'll spend a couple days, have a great time, and then we'll sue the piss out of them. Yeah. That's what Florida does. That's what Florida, that's what happens when they come to Florida. Um, they, I, I just I want to give you some examples of what we deal with every day. This is just one of my favorite days. This is a day in the life. This is from the Miami Herald. There's two headlines here that I have to explain to you. This is on the same page. It wasn't even on the front page. It wasn't even on the front page. Headline is, Mutant Alligators in Lake Apopka Raising Concerns. <laughs> we, we believe in understating things at the Miami Herald. <laughs> because most people, the, you see the word mutant and alligator in the same sentence, your concerns are more than raised. <laughs> and... It was, and by the way, it was raising concerns among the alligators, too, because what was happening is they were dumping all this pesticide in Lake Apopka, and it was, it was resulting in a genetic uh, disorder that, that caused the male alligators at a young age to morph into female alligators. And they were not happy with the change, apparently. It's not something they had in mind. So that's one story, mutant alligators. And then on the same page, one of the great crime stories in Florida history, wife gets 12-year term in lobster boy slaying. Lobster boy <laughs> slaying. Now, you're thinking to yourself, well, what's a lobster boy? In, in Florida, you may or may not know, in the wintertime, a lot of circus performers live in, in the Sarasota area. And, they, and there's a whole colony. They've been there for years. And one of the most prominent was, a, was a, an individual called Lobster Boy because of an unfortunate deformity of his hands. He had kind of like claw-like hands, and he was the original lobster boy. And he had, and despite the doctors urging him not to continue having babies because they were all afflicted with this, he had a bunch. So now there's still a lot of lobster boys around. But I'm not making fun, but this is a true story. Lobster boy, lobster boy was not a nice guy. He was, he was very, uh, he was, nobody really liked him. He was mean to his wife. He was a cranky guy, drank a lot. Uh, and I guess, who, you know, who wouldn't? Uh, I mean, honestly. <laughs> 
Um, anyway, so Lobster Boy, his wife couldn't take it anymore. He, she couldn't take it anymore, and she, so she went out to, to find a, a hitman to kill her, her husband, Lobster Boy. Now, let me just suggest to you that in, in that particular community of circus performers, there's not, there's not an abundance of competent hitmen. Um, <laughs> so, and, and, and she went, she, her first choice was a, was a guy whose who's, uh, who's, uh, professional what was known as the human blockhead. I, I'm not sure that would have been my first choice. If you're, the human blockhead got his name, uh, got his nickname. His act was taking um, two-inch carpenter nails and, and hammering them up his nose. I don't know what quali what, how that qualifies you to be a hitman, but anyway, she approached the human blockhead. He thought about it, decided <clears throat> he didn't, it wasn't for him. And he, but he recommended another, uh, another uh, uh, person. And the other, they also declined. Anyway, she winds up with a 15-year-old kid who, for the grand sum of $1,500, one night sneaks into lo Lobster Boys sitting in front of TV watching, I don't know, SpongeBob, who knows what he's, all he's watching. But bam, shoots him, shoots him dead. Out of season, by the way. Um, but the, uh, but I'll tell you, the, the judge was so sympathetic. When, when they got to the sentencing phase of the trial, there were very few witnesses had anything positive to say about Lobster Boy. So as a result, the, the judge um, gave the woman only 12 years, which is kind of a, a minimal sentence for that crime in Florida. But uh, as you can see, I mean, these things happen. If, if you put that into a novel, I'm just going to suggest to you that, first of all, nobody's going to believe it. I mean, you can see how frustrating and horrible it is for someone who's writing satire when this is what you're competing with every day of, of, the, of the year. Um, there's, a, there's another story I wanted to share with you. And, you, you know, the, the, new, fi the new thing is um, these CSI shows. You know, there's a CSI Miami, CSI New York, I don't know where else, CSI Little Rock, I don't know. Anyway, so this happened a couple years ago, and it was right near, uh, there's a, there, in Fort Lauderdale, where I, where I grew up, there was a, a park called Holiday Park. And in, in fact, it's the park where uh, Chris Everett, who was also born in Fort Lauderdale, a tennis player, learned to play tennis, and I think her, her dad may still teach there, I don't know. But anyway, so um, they have a CSI class at St. Thomas Aquinas High School, Catholic High School in Fort Lauderdale. And, it, and they're going to go out and do it. So the teacher's going to great pains to arrange a crime scene. And the, tri the whole deal is that the class is going to be brought there by bus, and the clues have been planted by the teachers. And, and they're going to do a forensic sweep, like you see on television, and find the clues to, to a fictitious homicide. So off they go. They get their fake crime scene and everything, and the kids are walking. And, and one of them says to the teacher, hey, look at, look at it. I found him. And they say, what would you find? I found I found the body. He goes, What, what body would that be? <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. They, they found a real homicide victim. And so the kids are all, initially the kids thought, this is the, the, the teacher's brilliant. This, the, and they all kind of rush over, and then they look, and, and it's not a mannequin. It's the real deal. And so, of course, now they're all witnesses, and the police come in, and then the real crime tape is put up, and it goes on and on. But, I mean, you know, you're watching the news at night, and you're going, oh, this is great. I mean, this is on-the-job training. I don't know how many... How many of those kids are going into forensic medicine after that experience? But, but um, anyway, the, the, uh, years ago I did a book called Strip Tease. It was a, it was a novel um, that was made into a movie with uh, Burt Reynolds and Demi Moore. And it was a, an interesting experience, the process of having the novel turn into film, a, a movie that was not, uh, not often compared to Citizen Kane by reviewers. But... Uh, <laughs> Nonetheless, in the defense of the director and the screenwriter, my, my novels are not easily translated to the screen, as you can imagine. So there was a, there was a couple of scenes in the movie where, I f where the, the, they kept from the book, pretty accurately from the book. And, and, but one of them they decided not to, not to do, but they alluded to it, was a scene in which the main character in the novel, um, the, the owner of this very, very nasty strip joint called the Eager Beaver, uh, he... he um, he decides that he's going to have all the dancers uh, wrestle in creamed corn, creamed corn. And of course, the minute the book comes out, I'm on tour. I get questioned about this all the 
People say, that's the grossest thing we've ever heard. You know, What's the matter? Are you really sick? And my mom was upset. Everybody was upset about it. <laughs> but again, it was based on, it was based on my, my, uh, my grown son was working at the Palm Beach Post at the time, and he sent me an ad for this, uh, for this adult gentleman's club, as we say in the South. It was, uh, it was near the, uh, the Palm Beach Airport. And the ad, Mr. T's it was called, and some of you have been there. I, don't say anything. I, I, I know. <laughs> Um, Mr. T's, it was called, and the ad was extraordinary, and I still have it here in the file, because it offered you the choice as a patron of, uh, of going there, and you could wrestle with uh, a dancer in any number of condiments. There was about a list of about 10 condiments you could get in, um, and there was uh, pasta, although I don't know whether it was penny pasta. I, mean, I didn't elaborate. There was, uh, you could wrestle with, uh, in pickles, dill pickles. Uh, you could wrestle in chocolate, you could wrestle in mayonnaise. It was just endless. So that's, I had to make a literary decision uh, going through this list, what would be funny but not so objectionable that it would make people nauseated. And I, I just picked cream corn. I thought, uh, because that was, that was on the list. Cream corn was on the list. Um, And again, I, you know, I have, to, I have to defend that. In, in, uh, in a novel I did called Skinny Dip, um, there's, a, there's a guy in the novel who has a, a drug addiction. I mean, you may have heard in South Florida we, we have some drugs in South Florida, occasionally passing through and, and otherwise. And, uh, and, and this is a very peculiar addiction that he had. It was to a, a drug called fentanyl, which is a powerful painkiller. It's often used in treatment of cancer patients. And it, among the other applications, it comes in a patch uh, that, that you can apply heavy-duty narcotic, and this guy had developed an addiction to it, and what he would do is, he, in, the, in the novel, he would break into nursing homes and hospices, and he would peel the patch off the patients while they were sleeping and slap it on himself, and he would go around with a number of these patches on him, and he shaved, he was real hairy, so he had to shave his whole body, but he was covered with patches half the time. And people, of course, said, that is the sickest thing we've ever read in our life. And I got a lot of letter from, letters from people sort of saying, don't, uh, don't badmouth fentanyl. It's been good for me. It was nothing to do with fentanyl. I didn't even make this up. It was a story that I ripped off right out of the pages of the Miami Herald. There was a guy going around to nursing homes, breaking in, stealing these patches off of people. And so I clipped it out, because I, I saw it immediately. I said, I've got to have a character who does this. <laughs> That's for me. But, of course, people think I'm, I love this. You know, I, I mean, I love to take credit for having a vivid imagination, but the truth is that I just stole that completely, and then I have to wave the clipping and say, no, no, I made it up. And I didn't make it up. The guy really was, really was stealing. I mean, it is a sick thing. They caught him. They caught him eventually. And, uh, but nonetheless, you put that in a novel, and people immediately assume there's something wrong with you. I can't imagine why. <laughs> Again, it's one of these literary decisions you make. And I'm sure if, if Faulkner or John Cheever or, or Updike were up here telling these, you'd hear similar stories from them, I'm sure. <laughs> I, did a, I did a novel years ago called Skin Tight, and it was a novel I, I had devised. The bad guy in this novel was, in my own mind, the worst plastic surgeon in the history of plastic surgery. And I had been inspired for an investigative series we had done at the Miami Herald, um, uh, by some of the characters we'd encountered during that. And, I, and so I'd taken the worst of all of them and, and created Rudy Graveline, Dr. Rudy Graveline, who had, in the novel had been kicked out of every state in the Union. Uh, his, his medical license had been, he'd been driven out of every state in the Union. He comes to South Florida and prospers immediately. He's welcomed with open arms. He opens a clinic on South Beach. He's doing, uh, you know, boob jobs five a day or ten a day, however you compute that. I mean, he's doing great. Um, and, and the novel opens, the novel opens with, uh, with him accidentally killing someone uh, during a, a nose job, a rhinoplasty. Now, again, people said, no, that, they don't make fun of that. But it really happened. Again, it was a clipping I'd seen. A, a person died in a routine, and the doctor had been, had been in all this trouble, and I thought, you know, I mean, it's tragic, but you think, what the hell? The, the eulogy has got to be uh, difficult. <laughs> I mean, you, they, you, 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 they died, you know, I just couldn't imagine the, the, the poor person having to write the eulogy. It's not a, not a way that I would want to go. But anyway, so I invent Rudy, and all kinds of bad things happen to Rudy, and he gets what he deserves in the end. And I think I'm done with the subject. Of I think I've now surpassed, I've gotten ahead of the curve of weirdness, like three months later. The, the roof comes crashing in on me. 
I'm reading in this, the Herald. I see, I've been seeing all these billboards around Miami, driving around Miami, advertising Dr. Lips. Dr. Lips, come see Dr. Lips. And he's a plastic surgeon who specializes in collagen injections into, into lips to make your lips full. First place, let me just, a word of advice. If you're thinking about plastic surgery, I would avoid going to anyone who, who, who is name, names himself after a part of your body. <laughs> I, I just, I don't see that as being a, a good thing. And Dr. Lips really was advertising. And so, but here's what happens. This pop star from, some, from South America comes up, has heard about Dr. Lips through the grapevine and, and comes up and he wants a lot of work done. He wants his lips done, of course, because that's, if you're going to Dr. Lips, why not? He also wants liposuction. He wants a little face, face lift. He wants a little bit of, you know, a little bit of work done all the way down to a very, personal part of his body that he would like to have uh, enlarged as a surprise to his girlfriend back home. Dr. Lips says, no problem, I can do it. Not only can I do it, I can do it in one day. <laughs> okay. The guy says, great, I can be home tomorrow. Get on the plane, go home tomorrow. So the procedure begins and they start apparently uh, at the lips and this goes smoothly. The lips go fine, and the patient is out, remember, he's unconscious. And they go down to the, and do the face, and then they do liposuction, and then they get to the part of the operation, which personally I would consider the most critical. Uh, and, and as they say on Fox News, something goes terribly wrong. Uh, and the guy, the guy expires on the operating table. Um, Again, another eulogy that I can't even <laughs> begin. I mean, I, and I mean, and it's quite possible he couldn't even close the casket in this particular case. <laughs> so you've got, yeah, as a writer, you think of these things. What do you say at the, bere oh, sorry. Anyway, so Dr. Lips, to, to, anyway, is arrested and he's convicted of manslaughter and he's no longer practicing medicine that I know of in South Florida. So I just put your mind at ease in case you were thinking about calling him. So that's crushing news enough because Dr. Lips has surpassed anything Rudy had ever done. But then a few months later, it gets worse. The saga of Mr. Mexico emerges. A Mr. Me former Mr. Mexico bodybuilder guy is walking with his girlfriend on South Beach in Lincoln Road Mall. And he's walking by and he sees a sign advertising plastic surgery. And he says, oh, let's go check it out. And then, by the way, this is how I pick my doctors, too. I'm sure you do, too. <laughs> Just walking around, see a sign. Hey, that looks cool. let's go have him cut on me for a while. Anyway, they walk in. The guy, and Mr. Mexico has a very unusual request. You know, he's, he's now like 48, and uh, he thinks he's getting out of shape. He's been in great shape, buff his whole life. But now he wants pectoral implants, which is something... I guess men are getting now, you know, to, and the shoulders make them look strong. I'm, I'm, you're laughing. I'm not kidding. Pectoral implants. Or unless you know somebody who has, I won't ask, but maybe. <laughs> right. Anyway, so he asked this guy, and the doctor says, absolutely, no problem. Pectoral I do them all the, all the time, pectoral implants. The guy says, good, I'll be back tomorrow. So he goes in the next day, and uh, they put him under, and th th he notices in, later in his deposition, he... <laughs> He remarks that he's a little disturbed because he keeps waking up during the procedure and he, he doesn't think that's exactly the way it's supposed to be and he notices not only is the doctor is kind of fuzzy, but the doctor's girlfriend has got a video camera going on here. Anyway, he goes back to sleep, he wakes up, he goes back to sleep. And, and what he doesn't know is the following. The gentleman who is operating on him is not a plastic surgeon. And he, in fact, he's not a medical doctor. In fact, he, he doesn't even have a general contractor's license in Dade <laughs> County, Florida. He is just a guy who makes a really nice shingle. <laughs> Secondly, not being a doctor and not being able to get a DEA number, he, he has no access to like real anesthesia. Right. So, but he does have a friend, he does have a friend who works at a veterinary clinic <laughs> who provides him with a drug called ketamine. Uh, and so what he has injected uh, Mr. Mexico with is a chihuahua-sized dose of ketamine because that's what they use them for on dogs and cats, and which explains why he keeps waking up. The third thing that the gentleman is not aware of is that th this guy's never done a pectoral implant before. And in fact, this office has just been leased. It, it, he just leased this office from another guy who left town. And basically, whatever is in the office is what he's using. 
and he's going through the drawers, and he finds, he's looking for pectoral implants, and there are none, and he opens the drawers, and there he sees a perfectly uh, lovely set of breast implants. And he thinks to himself, why the hell not? So that when Mr. Mexico, the next couple of days with his girlfriend, stands in front of the mirror and unwraps the bandage that's around his chest, he, he beholds uh, a, 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 a basically a rack right here. <laughs> Wisely, he drives straight to the Miami Beach Police Department. And, and I don't even imagine the scene when he... <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what the detectives must have said. But in any case, um, uh, it takes them a couple of days to get a warrant. By that time, the doctor has fled. And, but they, what, what he has left behind is the videotape of the whole you know, dismal procedure. He splits. And so... For years after this story ran, you know, I, I had this, you know, I, I was pissed anyway about the whole thing. But afterwards, you know, I had the feeling the guy was out there. And he was arrested last year. The same guy was arrested last year in Belize uh, doing the exact same thing. He was practicing plastic surgery in Belize. He's, they brought him back to Miami. He's in jail now. But this is what we deal with. I mean, this is what we every single day down here. And it drives me absolutely nuts. Um, life imitates art. In... And I'll tell you why this is. And I get, this is the other way I get pissed, is when, when I write something in a novel, and then it, then it happens. It just drives me crazy. It drives me nuts. Why? In, in striptease, uh, in the character played by Burt Reynolds in the movie, is a congressman named David Dilbeck, who, who gets infatuated with this uh, exotic dancer and, and just gets completely out of control with it. And it was based on uh, my own congressman uh, in, in Fort Lauderdale, Herb Burke, was busted in the strip joint. My first year at the Miami Herald, they, they busted him in a strip joint. And, and, um, and he was drunk, and, and Herb would be the first to tell you if you were around that he was drunk. And the reason he got busted, uh, and this came out later, was you know, he was getting a little grabby with some of the dancers. That wasn't the, his real sin. His real sin, apparently, was when uh, the, Herb was there almost every night, and he, and he never tipped them. So <laughs> someone just called up the sheriff and they busted Herb. And, and anyway, that was, that was where I got the idea for David Dilbeck. Well, misbehaving in the strip club. Well, right, right after the movie comes out, the uh, United States Attorney for the Southern District, most, one of the most powerful law enforcement people in the country, U.S. Attorney, uh, loses a big case in Miami, a big drug case that everyone thought was a slam dunk, a big cocaine case. He loses it gets bummed out, and that night he drives to a gentleman's club in South Dade, U.S. Attorney, presidential appointment, okay? And he goes, um, he goes, in he decides he's having a great time, and he goes into the champagne room with a dancer, and he, um, where he has a much better time, apparently, and, <laughs> and then he, he orders, and this is the brilliant part, he orders a $900 bottle of champagne. And if you've ever been to a strip joint, you know that they serve nothing but the finest <laughs> champagne. Um, orders a $900 bottle of champagne, and he puts it on his credit card. That's smart. And then, for whatever reason, he proceeds to bite the dancer. Bite her hard. Hard, and she screams, and some very large individuals then enter the room and attempt to remove the United States attorney from uh, the dancer, uh, pry his teeth off and drag him out. And he's screaming the whole while, you can't throw me out. I am the U.S. attorney for the Southern <laughs> District. They throw him into a cab. They throw him into a cab, and the cab gets about two miles, and he screams at the cab driver, you're kidnapping the U.S. attorney you better take me back to the strip joint. They take him back and he goes back into the strip joint. They have to drag him out again. All in all, he runs up about an $1,800 bill before this happened. His, his, um, again, on one point he takes out his, his little badge and ID, which is a very smart maneuver to do uh, when you're being arrested at a strip joint. By all means, tell him everything you can about yourself uh, just in case there's any doubt. So his father shows up the next day with a giant wad of cash and says, you know that credit card slip that my son left here last night. He's real sorry about everything that happened. Why don't I just give you the cash and you tear up the credit card slip? 
He said, oh, that's a good idea. And they took the cash. Meanwhile, this credit card slip has been Xeroxed about 50 billion <laughs> times by these people. So anyway, he, uh, he got in trouble and he, and he had to resign. The best part of that, of course, is that I get a call. I get a call from the husband of the dancer. And he says, uh, Amber, I'm sure, I'm sure that's the name she was born with, don't you think, Amber? Uh, Amber, was, uh, Amber was interested in writing a book. I said, really, a book about her two minutes and 45 seconds with the U.S. attorney of this? Yes, she's going to write a book about this. And he sent me, he was nice enough to send me a, a Polaroid of her bite marks, too, which I thought was uh, very considerate of him, just what I want to be looking at. Um, and I said, you know what, I've already written the book. I said, this jerk copied it, and I hung up on the guy. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna t I, wanna t I wanna tell you a couple love stories because I think things get lost in the, in the cynicism of journalism, and I, I, there's a couple love stories that I think you're, you're ready to hear about South Florida. Uh, two in particular are, are, are my favorites. One, um, one involves dolphins. And I know you all like Flipper and the dolphins and everything like that. Well, I, I grew up and I, you know, in the water, I always loved dolphins. And when I was a kid, they started opening these exhibits that you can go swim with the dolphins. And you might have done this at SeaWorld or you might have done it down at the Sea Aquarium. And what happens is you go and you, and, and they, for a pretty hefty sum of money now, I think it's like 150 bucks, you jump in the lagoon and, and swim with a real dolphin, which, believe me, is the highlight of every dolphin's day. You, you, got, you got to think that they can't wait for tourist number 75 to jump in and grab their dorsal fin or clap their hand. You know, it's great fun for the dolphins. Um, so the animal rights groups, of course, were upset about this, but the, the exhibit's open and they're, they're thriving. But, you know, dolphins are very smart. Their brains are larger than humans, as you probably know. And it, my theory is that is they just kind of had enough. I mean, they're not unionized or anything, but I think <laughs> at some level they had enough because what started happening was there was a series of um, attacks on tourists. There were a series of incidents um, in which they, uh, and we, Miami Herald is a family newspaper, so we euphemistically said that the dolphins were displaying aggressive behavior towards the tourists. It was much more than aggressive behavior. It was romantic behavior towards the tourists, <laughs> particularly the female tourists. The dolphins, uh, I guess in their own minds, they thought, well, they w if they want to see a trick, we're going to show them a trick. <laughs> now, without, without going into the gruesome details, let me say that a, 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 an adult male dolphin can weigh up to 800 pounds, okay, and is, is endowed proportionately. Um, so if you're a tourist, 120-pound legal secretary, let's say, uh, the one I interviewed for the paper, when I heard about this story, of course, I felt compelled as a journalist to go out and dig into it. So I, I, found, I, I found a legal secretary who had, who had had the full dolphin experience in the Keys. And, uh, and she gave quite a breathless account of what it was. And so, of course, I, I wrote a column and I slammed it into the paper. And, and, but I had been looking for, I mean, I have, let me backtrack a minute. I was in the middle of a novel at a time. And, and it, while I was in the middle of a novel, I had read a a piece in something called the Journal of Popular Culture analyzing all my novels. Someone had sent it to me. And it turns out I was brilliant. I read this. It turned out I was some kind of genius. And I read this thing and I thought, oh my God, I had no idea. And so I was really excited reading how imp important and, and all the symbolism in my, and I really, to me, it was always just psychotherapy. It was, it was sort of a legally acceptable outlet for, for some of the things I was feeling. But it was, turns out it was much more than that. It was brilliant literary tapestry. So I was very excited. At the end of the whole piece, the guy says, by the way, there's a recurring image in every Hyacinth novel. There's always a floater. Now, if, if, you know, if you're in, in law enforcement at all or, or an EMT or something, you know that in the parlance uh, of emergency of forensic medicine, a floater is a dead body in the water. Florida is surrounded by water. We have 1,400 miles of coastline. We have Lake Okeechobee. I didn't think anything about it when I was writing. When people die, a lot of times they're found in the water and they're floaters. But it turns out there had been a floater in every one of my novels up to that point. And I was two-thirds of the way through this novel and I had no floater. <laughs> I'm panic-stricken because this guy is probably his whole PhD thesis is, is, is hangs on the concept of me putting floaters in the novel. So I'm scrambling and I said, holy Christ, I've got to get a, a floater somewhere. 
Then it occurs to me, because this, is, this was a novel called um, Native Tongue, which was set at a cut-rate theme park in Key Largo. And it had a bunch of disreputable, it had like a real, it had a really bad, a killer whale that had been bounced from every sea world there was. They had a terrible flatulence problem, and they just kept moving the killer whale. <laughs> and then there was a rogue dolphin called Dickie the Dolphin. Um, <laughs> And so suddenly it dawned on me that I had now have the literary solution to this problem because my, I, so I had, the way I contrived this was that I had the good guy, my, my, the hero in my novel, there was a real bad guy who was based on a, a, a crooked Miami police officer who was on steroids all the time. And so in the book, he's, he's now a security guard at this, at this, uh, at this theme park and he's, and he's so hooked on steroids, he's dragging, he's dragging an IV rig around him all the time. It's, he's just getting mainlined with steroids. So anyway, there's a battle. It takes, I stage it at the, like moonlit night, clear sky. It's on the catwalk right above Dickie the Dolphin's tank. The bad guy, they're going at it and they're fighting. And my guy gets the last punch in and, and the bad guy, Pedro, goes in with his IV drip following him in, crashes into the water where he is immediately romanced to death by Dickie the Dolphin. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was very tastefully done. It was... <laughs> Yeah. It was, um, so, I mean, th so that's a little bit of insight into, into where my inspiration comes from. I'm going to tell two more stories and then I'm going to take some questions for you because I, there's, a couple, there's a couple stories I have, to, I have to end with. In all the novels, because I grew up basically, when I grew up, there were, you know, and where I grew up, in, it was literally on the edge of the Everglades and I spent all my time out with nature. And I, and I like nature, and I like, I like snakes, I like gators, I like all that stuff. And, and I'm always rooting, always rooting for the alligators, and always rooting. When there's a confrontation between man and nature, I'm rooting for the predator. I'm, ro I'm rooting for the, you know, so it, it's always a good thing. Um, there was a, the, the, so when I see stories like this, I, you know, I, and, and you're going to think that I'm probably not well, and, I, and I'm probably not, but I'm going to tell you, this happened just a couple weeks ago. And it, it falls into the category of crimes that solve themselves, okay? Crimes that solve themselves. We have a, a number of uh, Indian gaming reservations in South Florida, the Seminoles and the Miccosukees. And, um, and, and the Miccosukee Reservation is right on the edge of the Everglades, right off the Tamami Trail. It's quite a large facility. They've been having problems with car thieves, guys break, coming in at night and stealing cars. So one night, a, a guy and his friend decide they're going to steal a car. The guy's wanted. He's wanted on an outstanding felony warrant anyway. So he comes in, and they're breaking into a car, and somebody sees him, and the cops are called. So the police are coming in. Now, his buddy runs one way, and this gentleman says, I'm not going that way. I'm going back here, and I'm going to swim across this lake, and I'm going to get away. So he's running. The cops are after him. He dives in, and he's promptly eaten by an alligator. I'm thinking, okay, what's the problem now? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but what's the problem? Here's what pisses me off. The next day, they go and kill the alligator. I'm thinking, why? The, the, the thing deserves a Crime Stoppers Award. <laughs> you kill the alligator. It's crazy. He just saved the taxpayers of Dade County probably 100,000 bucks. You know, I mean, at some point, Darwinism, you have to, whether you believe in it or not, there are hints that this is part of the, of the process of thinning the herd. Is it not? <laughs> if you're dumb enough at night to jump into a lake in the Everglades behind an Indian reservation, the odds are excellent that you are going to get eaten by an alligator. It's just... And then there's this story, and I will end with this because I just love it. I love it when nature bites back. I do. Uh, I don't know if any of you, and if you, if you, were, if this, if you were married at Disney World, for, forgive this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> up, t up till a few years ago, you, you had to, at Disney World, you had the option um, if you wanted to pay for it. They had this lavish wedding that took place, uh, usually around as the sun was going down late in the afternoon, beautiful skies. And you'd be married out in the open in a nice little gazebo, and then at the end of the ceremony when you said, I do, and your betrothed said, I do. They released hundreds and hundreds of white doves, hundreds of them, up to the sky. Glorious. 
They're really white pigeons. They're homing pigeons. They're not really doves. But pigeons doesn't sound as romantic. But they were really white pigeons. Well, when they were building Disney World and they were putting together the tracks for Disney World, um, and as Disney World has gotten bigger, of course, it's displaced a certain number of uh, type of species that, were, that had been native to that area. And one of the species that had been sort of moved out by the growth of Disney World was the red-tailed hawk. <laughs> now, there was quite a bit of green space, green belt around Disney World and, and lots of trees. So the hawks didn't move that far. And as you probably know, if you know anything about birds of prey, hawks have excellent eyes. They can see six to seven times better than the human eye. So the hawks that had been moved out of Disney World and probably the generations of generations of hawks that were now living off property, uh, every day around sunset they would look over and they would see this vast cloud <laughs> of pigeons rising mystically up to the heavens. And they thought, hmm. and so they started moving a little bit closer back to the property. And other hawks began to notice. And soon there was a very healthy population of hawks that was sort of edging its way back to the Disney property until, until as, as again they would say on Fox News, something went terribly wrong. <laughs> um, one night the pigeons went up and carnage ensued. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the newly married couple, uh, feathers, broken bones, blood falling from the sky, and birds flying. It was just... And, and this began happening with disturbing regularity. Uh, once the word got out in the hawk community, apparently... So then finally, finally this headline appeared in the Orlando Sentinel. And this, this tells the whole story. Disney seeks homes for about 200 surviving pigeons. It's <laughs> the end of it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a sick person for laughing at that, but you have to admit. Um, I, have been, I promised to take some questions, and that I would do if they could give me some house lights. Thanks. You're numb, aren't you? You're just stunned. I don't, I don't blame you. I, I, I apologize. Yes, ma'am. Skink. Oh, yes. I should mention Skink. He, he appears in several of my novels. He's a the former governor of Florida who went crazy in Tallahassee, the state capital. And uh, he was a Vietnam War hero, fictitiously, of course. And he was, uh, I promote him in the novel as the one honest governor we've ever had. And, of course, he wasn't going to last maybe a month or two in Tallahassee with that condition. And he goes crazy, and he just ran off and lived in the woods, and he eats roadkill. And uh, I just had, he'd started as a, uh, a walk-on character in a novel I wrote called Double Whammy, which is about sex, murder, and corruption on the professional bass fishing circuit. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's territory that I pretty much had to myself. Uh, uh, <laughs> but th that's, where, that's where Skink first appeared. And, I, and he's one of those characters that I invented him just because I needed a hermit guy in this particular chapter. But I liked him so much and he, and, uh, and he was, that he just sort of took over. And I left him in that book and he sort of grew and became sort of the strange moral compass of, of that novel and several others. And, and he hasn't been around for a while because he's, he's getting old and cranky, but I suspect I've got to bring him out. The one thing I will worry about, though, if you're an aspiring writer, is to, is to stay away, if possible, from the subject of roadkill. And let me, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you why. To me, I was, again, it was something I'd clipped out of a paper about a Pennsylvania state trooper who was known as Officer Roadkill because in the wintertime, if there was ever a dead deer on the road or something, he'd come racing from wherever and he'd throw it in his freezer. And he was the guy you called if there was roadkill. So I kind of got, you know, so I just threw that in with Skink, because if he's living in the woods, there aren't many wild animals to eat anymore. So he's probably grabbing a dead armadillo or two off the highway. So uh, anyway, I didn't realize there's a whole roadkill cult in this country, because I started <laughs> receiving recipes in the mail. <laughs> and, and, and some of the people who showed up my book signings were very, very creepy. Uh, <laughs> I was, at a, I was at a book signing in Winnetka, Illinois, and, and someone is waiting patiently in line, and they have 
a whole oil painting that they have done of a roadkill for me. And it, was, it wasn't abstract either. Let me assure you. It was, and I mean, it, it's just down to the little tread marks on the little tuft of fur on the highway. And this, it was done on a piece of wood, and it was with great effort. Um, and I thought to myself, now I'm trying to think of what, what, what happened. Are you in your house, and you hear a screech of tires, and you grab your pallet, and you grab your easel, and you run down to the, the road, and you, and you do this? What the? But it's frightening. So, and, but I, I haven't really found a place to hang it yet. I, I, anyway, stay away from roadkill. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. We have a lot of uh, public servants who, who, as you know, get in trouble in South Florida, and some of them, some of them do fine, and others, uh, others go away for long periods of time, and others <laughs> cop out. I don't know. I mean, I, I can give you the names of several good defense lawyers because they're, they're, they're friends of mine. Russia's defense lawyer is actually a friend of mine. I could line you up with him, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, it, we, we, have, we have some things going on down there. Of course, it's full of, uh, full of I'll tell you one famous, fun favorite corruption story I have. There was a guy, there was a guy who was a city councilman and uh, city commissioner in Miami uh, named Humberto Hernandez who, who, who made his reputation, and you're going to love this story. Years ago, a value jet crashed in the Everglades. Everybody was killed. Terrible, terrible story. Well, Humberto was running a law firm at the time, and he sent people to the scene, the bus that they were taking the relatives of the survivors out to, it was in the middle of the Everglades, out to where this happened. He planted some of his office workers on this bus, posing as, as relatives of victims. Okay, everybody died. And they went around pressing his business card into the palms of the hands of these grieving people. And I'll tell you, it doesn't, it takes a lot to get the attention of the Florida bar. It, it takes a lot. You practically have to kill somebody. And, but they, even they took notice of this, and he was censured and rebuked, and Berto was. And, of course, he won election by a landslide. This is in Miami, yes. So um, he was arrested. There was, uh, he was later arrested for uh, multiple charges of, of money laundering and he also of a, fixing an election. So they combined all the charges, and he was going off for five years. My favorite story. This is better than going to jail. He was going off for five years, and, and he's sitting in the can where he richly deserved to be, and it comes to light that his defense attorney, his defense attorney had been doing to Umberto's wife what Umberto had been doing to the taxpayers of South Florida <laughs> for years. It was a beautiful story, a beautiful ending. I loved it. So there was a lot of drugs and there was a lot of... Bimini, if you haven't been there, you fly in. It's only about 80 miles off the coast of Palm Beach. And you fly in and what you see as you're, as you're landing is in the water, airplane wreckage everywhere. Seriously, from all the smugglers who didn't make it. There's, de there's, there's airplane wrecks everywhere. And I, when you land, there are several planes that are in the bushes riddled with bullets right next to you. It's, it's a very, it's a good family place. I would recommend it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, chemo, the weed whacker. Yeah, you know, that was, that's one that I really have trouble explaining. Um, there, this was in skin tight. There was a bad guy, and, and he had an um, unfortunate uh, dermatological condition res resulting from a, a tragic uh, electrolysis mishap when he was young. They'd given him a complexion, a, a very unsavory complexion, and, and he was cruelly uh, nicknamed Chemo. And so he had a chip on his shoulder, and uh, he worked at a bouncer, as a bouncer at, at a punk club on, on Miami Beach. And I had been in this punk club, or one like it, and I, had always, I felt so sorry for the bouncers because it was total mayhem. And, I, and, the, and the mayor of Miami Beach was there at the time was before he went off to jail. Um, and he was there with his girlfriend. I, this scene is, I mean, there's violent people fighting and everything. And I felt so bad for the bouncers. I thought, and I just said at the time to the person I was with, I said, you know what would really work in here? One of those big industrial weed whackers. If you cracked up, you know, crank up one of those puppies, we'll straighten this whole thing out. So then when Chemo lost his arm, uh, Chemo lost his arm to a barracuda, which was based on a real incident. And, um, and, and, he, didn't, and he didn't have a, I was trying to think of a kind of a, a nifty prosthesis because a guy like Chemo isn't just going to go out and get a regular prosthesis. You can't do that if you're in a bouncer. So I thought, well, it would be cool if he had a weed whacker attached to his arm <laughs> that he could just 
crank up anytime you wanted to. So I went to, uh, I, went to I, I had a long talk with a plastic surgeon whom I knew, and I said to him, I said, Jerry, say I wanted to have a weed whacker attached to my arm. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I don't, want to, I don't want you to tell me whether it's plausible or not. I want you to tell me if it's possible. And, and he sat down and he drew a thing where you had the battery, you could have a battery rig kind of hanging from a sling. We had the whole thing worked out. And I said, once I knew it could be done, it went right in the book. That's, again, that's how, this is, you're getting into the heart of sort of the, the, the creative literary process here. Um, but that's how it's done. I just said, Can I, know I want a weed whacker on this guy's arm. He said, okay. So that's how I did it. Uh, you're all just, yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> appendage is missing. Some of those, but they do have append. They have extra appendages. Well, yes, but here's a lot of the of the bad guys, and the reason I, I always want to burden the bad guys in my novel with something. I want them to be dragging something, uh, since they don't have a conscience. They need to be dragging something with them on their journey. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you that in Double Whammy, this was, this was one, of my, one of my classics, was at the time I was writing Double Whammy, pit bulls were the rage. And, and, and I think they still are in some places, apparently. NFL, I guess. Um, but, you know, there was a pit bull on the cover of Newsweek while I was working on this book. So I said, I, gotta, I, gotta, I wanted to be topical. I said, I want to work a pit bull into this book. And so I had a very bad guy who was a burglar. And, uh, and he, was, he was burglarizing a mobile home. And back in those days in South Florida, there was a law that it, it, every mobile home had to have at least two or three free-running pit bulls that would attack people. <laughs> so, so he's breaking into the mobile home, and he gets attacked by this pit bull, and he stabs him with a screwdriver, and he kills the dog, but the dog doesn't let go. Even in death, even in death, it doesn't let go. So now he's got this dog on his arm. And it's the beginning of a, a relationship that goes on for about 104 pages in this book. He has to go through the toll booth. He's got the dog. And he becomes delirious. You know, he becomes sick and delirious. The dog's name is Lucas, and he, he names it Lucas, and he's petting, and he goes crazy. He's <laughs> stuffing dog food into his mouth. It's so disgusting. <clears throat> but again, again, it was my idea of what would happen, because I, I knew that pit bulls could be very tenacious, and I figured, why not the ultimate pit bull? It was like the ultimate plastic, or this is the ultimate pit bull. And so, and, that, and, and there's, and Lucas. And, and anyway, Lucas, he finally get a divorce, but it goes on for quite a while. Um, so this is another idea of the kind of fans I have. It's so disturbing. I was in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, was at a book signing in Boulder, Colorado, and, and I'm signing books, and everyone's very nice. And, and a, woman, uh, a woman about my mom's age comes up, um, probably you know, in her late 70s, 80s, something. She comes up, she leans over, and she says, Double Whammy was my favorite novel. And I said, well, that's very sweet. That's very sweet of you. I said, I'm signing a book. I'm thinking, okay, I'll t you know, that's okay. I said, I love Double Whammy. She goes up, and then she whispers to me. I'm not making this up. She whispers, she, I named my tumor Lucas. <laughs> now, I would be willing to bet that I am the only writer who's ever been at this series who's had a malignancy named after one of their characters. <laughs> now, I don't want to offend this woman. I mean, I suppose I should be flattered. I'm not sure what the proper reaction is. I'm sitting there, I've got a pen in my hand, the book in front of me, and she's smiling and nodding, saying she's named her tumor after a deceased pit bull that was in one of my novels. So, and, and, then she, and then she rolls up her sleeve to show me the, the scar from where she, and she, and she goes, don't worry. She, she goes, it's gone. And I said, and all I could say was, are you okay now? She says, I'm fine. Fine. She gives me a smile and a thumbs up and off she goes. These are my fans. <laughs> so. uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, that said, the children's book. That's very interesting. Um, uh, several years ago, an editor called me up and said, uh, would you ever be interested in writing novels for young adults or children? And then my first reaction is obviously, I said, well, you've, clearly you've never read anything I've read. Yet. Um, and she goes, no, I have. She goes, but the, the themes of nature, the themes of uh, the, the environmental themes, um, and, and some of the moral themes of your books we think would be good. And she, I said, I don't know. I, I really, that frightens me. So I, I talked to my agent about it, and, and at the time, uh, my, my stepson and my, uh, my niece, 
nieces and nephews were all about, all in an age where they were wanted to read my grown-up books, and I just couldn't. I, I obviously I couldn't give them you know you, the these stories. I couldn't let them read this stuff. Um, it was and I and, but I felt bad. They wanted and I thought, well, here's a chance for me to write a book. It can be just as smart ass as my other books. It can have the same satirical tone, the same thing, you know, the same sort of themes that I'm interested in, and 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 I, I'll be able to give it to them, and and they, you know, and, and not be worried about corrupting them necessarily. So, so that's how Hoot started. I, I, which Hoot was just a page out of my own childhood. We had these little tiny burrowing owls where I grew up, and um, they would just, they were everywhere. They're beautiful little things, and you know, they would come to. A new subdivision was going up every other day in South Florida back in the 50s and 60s, and um, they would just bulldoze all the nests with the birds in them. And, and my friends and I at the time, of course, we did the things the kids did in the novel. We moved the survey stakes. We did everything we could to try to sabotage the project. None of it worked, of course. They killed all the birds anyway. But here was a chance to write a story in which the ending was a happy one instead of what really happened. And so that's, how, that's where Hoot came from, and I had no idea. Honestly, I wrote it really just for the kids in my own family. I had no idea. It was, I think there's over two million in print now, and it was just baffling to me. that. And I get letters from all over the world about that book. And, and it's interesting. Uh, some of the letters say, and it's and sad and touching too in a way, because they say, how did you make up those little owls? And I said, you know, these are letters from city kids a lot of them. I said, I didn't make up those owls. They, they were there when I was a when I was little, and that's what, you know. So th that's where it started, and, and I had no, and, and, the, and the response has been, I mean, I've gotten thousands and thousands of letters, and, and uh, they teach these books in schools, and schools now. It's just, it's been mind-boggling to me. I'm finishing another kid's book now, as a matter of fact. Um, <clears throat> but at the time, you know, you think, I, I thought maybe the kids in Florida would get it. I had no idea, you know, that, that it would strike the note. So it's been a very rewarding thing for me. Now, now the kids I wrote it for are old enough. Now they're reading the sick stuff. <laughs> so <clears throat> didn't do any good. Didn't stop them from doing that. Yep. Yes. Uh, no. Uh, Scientology is itself. Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, how do you how do you improve on the truth? I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you, if you, did you see the Tom Cruise tape? Oh my God! I mean. You can't beat that. See, I have to stay away from stuff that is funnier in real life than it could ever be in fiction. <laughs> can, I tell, can I tell one quick Clearwater story, though? This is true. I did a novel called, um, well, in the novel, it was Lucky You, um, there's a fictio fictitious town called Grange, Florida, where they, it's a town of miracles. And, and really it is, it's a town of scammers who, 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 who just scam people with religious miracles. And, and one, of the, one guy has stigmata, you know, and he wanders around and gets money, and you know, he cuts himself. You know, all these guys are scamming. And one of the main attractions is a stain. It's an oil stain. It's a road stain Jesus. And it's, uh, it's a stain in the middle of the main highway going through town. Somebody thinks this looks like Jesus. And, so they, and people come from everywhere to look at the road stain Jesus. That was based on a real case. And clearly you probably know the one I'm talking about. There's a, there's a bank building there. And they, they have sprinkler system. And in Florida, the water's often got some tannic qualities to it. So it, it, can, it looks like it gets rusty on the side of a building. And this is a glass building. So it, gets, it was a stain. <clears throat> Somebody driving by, who obviously was on something, looked one day and said, oh, that stain looks like, that looks like the Virgin Mary. And, and some radio station picked up. And some TV station, you know, they'll go out at the drop of a hat. And, and then they, and, and here's the, giant sprinkler stain. They said, this is a Virgin Mary. And, and you know, if you, if you follow the Bible at all, that if, if, if the Virgin Mary was ever going to come back to earth and reveal herself, it, it would be on the, in a sprinkler stain on the side of a bank, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, of course it would. So people start flooding into clear water, flooding from everywhere. And they have to put up a stoplight at this intersection. Then they have to put up benches for the pilgrims, pilgrims who are coming to worship at the bloody sprinkler stand. It's a, it was a great story. It was a great story. Here's the best part. This is a mortgage building, right? People are leaving money on the steps of a mortgage building. <laughs> offering Offerings to the sprinkler stain, Mother Mary. <clears throat> So that's where the, the, the that's where the road stained Jesus came from because I thought, you know, heck, it would work.
It would work. I know. We know it would work. Okay. <laughs> Above water? The question... <laughs> The question was, in the light of global warming, how much longer uh, Miami will be afloat? I, you know, you, all you can do is pray. I just, every day, <laughs> it would be a great thing for South Beach. They'd still go. I think they'd still find a way to, the, the celebrities would still find a way to go to South Beach. But it is a real problem. I mean, it's, it, we, had a, we didn't have any hurricanes this last year, but we had some, a lot of tropical weather. And there was this massive erosion on the beaches. The beaches are shrinking. People, and there are buildings now teetering on the edge of the ocean. And so what they do is the taxpayers get to fund huge beach renourishment programs where they go out and they dredge up all this sand and rock and they pump it with giant dredges back on the beach. And it's, it has the consistency of a, you know, of, a, of a broken Mountain Dew bottle under your feet. <laughs> it's very much fun to walk on and lie on. They just pile this crap on and now there's, there's a new beach so they can take a picture and they can put it on the website and say, come to our beaches. I mean, there, there's a whole phony quality about it. Most people don't realize there was, there was no Miami Beach. Miami Beach was a mangrove island. And, and it was, it, the beach was fake even 50 years ago. So it's all going to get eaten away eventually. And, and uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm always rooting for, uh, you know, I'm sure that, uh, you know, my house and the keys will be gone someday. But, you know, that's nature. It's okay. Um, I think uh, I just, uh, the property values will probably be affected negatively when it happens, but <laughs> <laughs> who cares? At that point, we'll probably all be gone. One more question. Nobody wants to be. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, what work did you do? Oh, on the movie? Who? Oh, I work with Jimmy. Jimmy was the executive producer. He's an old, old friend of mine, and he had called me. His daughter had read the book, Hoot, and uh, Jimmy thought it would make a nice movie, and he called me, and... Um, He's a great guy. He's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, he would come. I was, I was living in the Keys at the time. And Jimmy, if you know anything about him at all, he, 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 lives, he lives the life that he portrays in his songs. He would fly down on his seaplane and come to my house by seaplane. And we'd work on the, the outlines and the screenwriter and the director. And, you know, I, I had a GPS unit that I barely knew how to use. But Jimmy would be in his plane saying, give me, you know, give me the numbers. You know, and I'm, I don't know, I'm just out in my backyard looking up, and there's a plane going, I don't know what the hell the numbers are. But um, it, it was fun. I think he had a good time. He got his acting debut, or I guess he's in there. And, uh, um, you know, we, we had a rough, you know, in the, in the box office, the movie didn't do very well at all. We opened against Tom Cruise and a couple other big movies. But in DVD, a lot of, a lot of kids had bought that, uh, and, and bought the soundtrack as well. I get letters all the time from kids that love the movie. So, and I just saw, I just saw him last week, by the way, and uh, he's, doing, he's doing quite well. He's doing fine. And, um, but, you know, he's an old fr When my first novel came out, Tourist Season, he, um, this is before they had, like, cell phones. I mean, this was 85 or 86, something. He call, I remember I was impressed because he called me from the freeway in Los Angeles <laughs> and said, I want to option your your book for me, and I already sold the, the movie rights to that book, but we became friends and, and ever since then. But I, I never figured out how he called me, but I guess it's some sort of magic phone. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> anyway he's, a, he's a great guy, and he's a great conservationist, and, uh, you know, just a, a real character. And he should be, if you've read his book, there's some things he hasn't put in his books that I keep wanting him to put in his own novels, because uh, he says maybe when, maybe, maybe his last novel he'll put it in, I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, listen, you all have been great. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.